Today is the second in our winter series on corrosion perspectives. Last week, we started this current series on corrosion perspectives, and Neil Webb shared some of his thoughts and his perspectives. If you missed the discussion, I really encourage you to have a quick watch. What we highlighted last week was that the corrosion of iron is the same, pretty much regardless of where in the world one is. But there are definitely local perspectives, kind of a local flavor that relates to perhaps the geography or the climate, which can influence the protection methods you might use. Now, having looked local to ourselves, today is the time to look at corrosion perspectives there. And where's there? Well, I reckon that must be England. And I'm really excited to introduce our guest for today, who is in England, Mr. Ken Lax. And Ken is the Technical Director of Coro Consult in the UK. Ken has such an interesting background. An engineer who originally trained in marine, radio, radar, sonar, electronics. He spent some time in the Arctic, as well as in, in, in Antarctica, doing high latitude geophysical research, which sounds completely fascinating, but it's not the topic of today's conversation. Ken ventured into the world of corrosion in the early 1980s, and he's never left. So it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome Ken to Bite Size Corrosion today. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I know that you're an active participant in the development and updating of ISO standards like ISO 15589 part one and many others. And I'm hoping that later in our discussion today, we might get to chat a little bit more about that. But I was particularly intrigued to see that you have a great interest and expertise in stray current interference. And naively, I confess to having no real idea that there was stray current interference in the UK. So my question to you is, how did you get involved? Well, it's a, it's a roundabout story, really. Uh, as you mentioned, my background was electrical. When I started in the cathodic protection world, I took no notice, really, of electrochemistry because, to me, it was a purely electrical problem. And provided you knew a bit about Ohm's law and a little bit about where the current goes from Kirchhoff's law, you could pretty well deal with everything that came up. And for a long time, that's, that's what I did. And I became involved in the stray current corrosion simply because I had this electrical background and people asked me to look at a few things. And I thought, crikey, I don't know much about this. This is, uh, seems a bit difficult. Anyway, I, I sorted out the first little problem I had, which was minuscule. And then about 42 years ago, I'm reliably informed by Neil Webb, I was in South Africa doing some close interval potential surveys with a new technique we developed, which for the first time in the world, we had synchronized switching and synchronized measurement. So you didn't actually have to guess when it was on or off, you, you knew. And during the course of that trip with Neil working on these pipelines, he said, would I like to see some stray current? So I thought, well, that sounds pretty interesting. So we went out to a place which I recall was called Whitbank and mm -hmm. stood by this drainage bond. I thought, crikey, they've gone a bit over the top with this bond. It's enormous. You know, our bonds are small things. And Neil opened the door and there was this cabinet with a, a great big ammeter in it. And I said, what does this do? And he said, well, wait. And then some trains appeared and it was a double headed train, enormously long, longer than I'd ever seen, full of ore. So it's tremendously heavy. And I watched enthralled as the ammeter just crawled up and crawled up and crawled up and, and gradually went round and round. I thought, crikey, it's, it's going to go over the end stop. And then it, it went away. So I said to Neil, what was that? So that was my first introduction to proper railway stray <laughs> current, which was uh, courtesy of Neil Webb. Oh, it's so interesting to me that it started in South Africa for you and we're back talking with you from South Africa. So, so that kind of appeases Full a circle. certain element in me. <laughs> Absolutely. Back in the UK, stray currents, where would you be encountering them also associated with rail? It's a very good question because I'm obviously 42 years wiser now than I was then. And I've done a lot of stray current work around the world, principally on railways metro systems and also AC uh, overhead stuff because my background gives me a little bit of a head start over say a metallurgist or a chemist and that I do understand a lot about the electromagnetic waves and the influence they have. 
But these days, stray current can originate from lots of things, offshore wind farms. They create stray currents because although they vary a little bit, but most of them generate DC offshore mm -hmm. and it comes ashore in cables and it crosses our pipelines. So you've got this big magnetic field, which is static with DC, but when they switch it off or it changes direction, the field collapses and builds up again. And the induced voltage is proportional to not just how big the field is, but how quickly it changes. So you get very rapid changes there. And then eventually, of course, they have to put this electricity into the distribution system, into the AC system. So they mm. have to convert it to AC. And they do that by a very crude method of chopping up the DC and adding it all up until you get something like a sine wave. And then they connect it back into the power system. So where you get this chopping up, you get lots of harmonics and harmonics are horrible things for electrical engineers because in, in South Africa, you have a 50 Hertz um, yes. frequency on your mains. Well, every third harmonic, like a 150 Hertz and, and, and they're up in, in visions of three, actually makes the waves add up without going, it's quite complex how you, it's not like DC where you just put two in parallel and you, you get what, what you get. But with AC, it varies and every third harmonic adds. So though you might have a peak voltage anticipated of 100 volts, say, when you add in this harmonic, which comes from this chopping, then mm. you, you get additional problems. So it's no good doing your calculations based on 50 hertz, you have to do all these harmonics. So that's wind farms. And now we have solar farms in the UK as well, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and because we have so little sun, they're huge. They're hectares yes. of, of panels, absolute hectares. Of the isolation resistance between the PV panel and the steel frame it sits on varies. And with us, it varies when it rains or when it snows and then melts and so on. And then the current leaks into the ground and finds its way onto the pipeline. And similarly, they have inverters to chop up the DC to make AC. So we get a, a problem the there. Problem. And we also same. have problems from high voltage DC power systems, which is a, a power sharing system between countries. So we've got okay. some between Wales and Ireland, England and Ireland, Sweden and Finland, Finland and Norway, Finland and Germany. And these are very, very high currents, thousands of amps of mm. current. And sooner or later, that has to be converted into AC. So you get the problem with the, the inverters the and with the DC. And sometimes they use the earth as a DC return because it's cheaper. You just have two electrodes, stick one on the coast of Finland and one on the coast of Sweden. And you've got your return circuit, which plays absolute havoc with CP, where we're looking at something between about minus 0.5 volts and minus 1.2 volts. So yes. when we get these huge ground swings and with the D HVDC, it also heats up the soil and causes problems not related particularly to corrosion. So we've got all these things. Plus we, ha we have an underground system, a metro system, and the London system is like topsy really. It's just growed and if you have a DC rail system and you've got the running rails, we sometimes use those to return the DC current, which mm -hmm. means they have to be literally isolated from the earth with separating insulated sleepers and so on. Mm -hmm. That's called a third rail system where you pick up the, the positive side on a rail that runs beside the two running rails and you return, it goes through the motor and then returns through the running rails back to the source. So if you get leakage from these isolated rails, you get stray current. And the London Underground runs on a four rail system, which has two for the running rails, one for the positive and one for the negative. And you think that you wouldn't get any stray current from that. But in fact, they will run the rail with very high leakage to earth to keep the trains running, which causes absolute havoc for the the CP, the and then we've got AC railway systems, which are earthed for safety reasons, but where the DC meets the AC railway, you've got an isolated system meeting an earth system. So there's all kinds of things happen there. And we've written some standards about how you can 
marry these two up. So it's quite a problem. And similarly, we've got high speed AC railways that run on 25 kV, which I think is probably similar to the one you have coming from the airport in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. And you might think, well, a typical CP defect might be a centimeter squared, for example. And if you've got a train doing 200 kilometers per hour, that's maybe 30, 40 meters long, then that whizzes past the, the little defect. And in fact, if you're a, a nerd like me, you calculate how long it takes. And it, it's about 0 0.002 thousandths of a second for <laughs> the interference to pass. And you think, oh, well, that's not a problem because corrosion has got a time element to it. But in fact, the current goes all the way through and past the defect all the time because the train picks up the power from substation okay. A and substation B. When it's in the yes. middle, it gets 50% from the one in front and 50% from the one behind, but 100% of it runs through the, the running rails to earth. So we, we have issues with that as well. And unlike Africa, we don't have a lot of real estate. We're a tiny island, so everything is close together. So you've got high pressure pipelines, and in London, there was a problem with a high pressure sewage pipeline crossing um, an underground train line. Mm -hmm. And it's so close to the rail, you can actually see it. They can't investigate this pipe because it's been there since Victorian days, I suppose. Wow. And they can't inspect it. They can't replace it. They can't change it. When they wanted to extend the line, they said, well, you can't do it because you can't guarantee you won't cause any interference. Mm -hmm. And it runs across the rails but above it is a road bridge and they can't raise the bridge so we can't raise the line and they can't lower the pipe so eventually we put our thinking caps on and we decided we'd put an impressed current system on this there are two pipelines close together these cast iron lines they're uncoated and we had enough power to protect them and we made it an automatic sensing system. So it measures the potential and then changes the output in right, order to yes. keep the potential steady. But the owners of the water pipeline or sewage pipeline said, well, how do we know it's not corroding? So during the construction, we installed some electrical resistance probes to measure the corrosion rate, which we'd been sending back the data by telemetry now for about 14 years. And we've maintained the corrosion rate at zero where the current moves up and down all the time. I don't know if, if you've ever contemplated how your final days might come, Vanessa, but I never imagined a tsunami of high pressurized effluent running down towards me while I'm sitting on a 750 volt line. And that would have been the consequence of, mm -hmm. of a, a burst on this pipe. And it's still running now. That's the kind yeah. of stray current problems we deal with. Fascinating. And, and a comment that you made about the space congestion in the UK, I'd never thought of it in terms of services. We joke here, you know, South Africa fits into virtually the Kruger Park, which is where we go for holidays and where you live. But just thinking about, well, all of the services, your power, your, your transport, your carrying of, of fluids is all in that small space. Yeah, Everything we have what I they call guess. energy corridors where yeah. you have the AC power lines above them as well on the cross country ones. And more recently, we're burying more AC cables right. than we used to. And of course, you get just as much electromagnetic interference from a buried cable as you do from a cable in the air. And that I was not aware of. And there are, That's there all there there are special you... ways you can lay the cable if you lay it. In what's called a trefoil, a bunch of three like that, mm -hmm. the waves cancel out a little bit and okay. you don't get so much interference. Or you can persuade them to cross your pipeline at 90 degrees, which yes. reduces the risk considerably. But mm -hmm. all of these things we have to deal with. Because that's really interesting. And it's certainly given me a different perspective of what you're experiencing in terms of stray currents. And that they may not be as extreme perhaps as the stray current interference that we deal with here, but in some ways maybe more critical because of the close proximity between your population and the pipeline that one is trying not to have burst and create fountains of sewage or water or fuel or any other thing. 
that's very true. In London, as you know, it, it's had a metro system since the Victorian days when it was mm. with steam trains. And there was a tunnel constructed between about 1825 and 1843, designed and built by a famous civil engineer called Brunel. That tunnel is still in operation today. It runs between two stations on the London Overground called Wapping and Rotherhithe. It's about near enough 400 metres long. And it's a protected monument. You can't actually even put a nail in the wall to put a, a cable tray up. It was built, dug by hand, and they've got little Doric and Ionic columns in little alcoves where people could sit because originally it wasn't made for trains. It was made for horses and carriages and for people to walk through. And in there, we've got a stray current corrosion problem, which is exacerbated by what we can do mm -hmm. in there, actually. And there we've used a combination of actually special coatings and stray current mitigation. It's a difficult problem. But if you're ever in London and you go through that little tunnel, it carries a train about every four minutes during the rush hour in both directions. And we continuously monitor the voltage and the current, the running current in the rails, which is exacerbated by the fact that they have a system where when they break the train, mm -hmm. instead of dissipating that energy as heat, it re-injects it into the railway system. So just when you think you're, you're okay because the current's low, it suddenly squirts another couple of hundred amps back in from a different direction. So again, we, we're monitoring that continuously. But we, we've had the benefit of learning about stray current in the UK from the days of the trams in the holiday regions, a, a place called Blackpool in the northwest of mm. England. But really the modern day knowledge, we rely heavily on, on the experiences that you have with your heavy currents on, on railway systems. And we wrote a standard specifically to deal with stray currents called it's ISO 21857, which Neil participated in for a short period, and that we tried to encompass everybody's global experience into there. And we even covered things like telluric currents from geomagnetic storms mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. pipes. We gave people a way how to calculate what that interference would be. And we looked at voltages induced by tidal changing streams in the, in the salty water and so on. It's fantastic that in addition to fighting the problem, you've also spent some time developing these standards so that others can benefit from your knowledge. That's really heartwarming, actually. Thank you. Um, well, it's jolly hard work, but it was quite controversial as well because uh, everybody has their own point of view. Yes, and, and stray currents seem to bring out some of the worst in people because we can be a little dogmatic in the way we approach them. A solution and because it's worked in a particular instance we believe it'll work a everywhere and of course i'm always right that's very true it's a very good observation because we partly made a rod for our own backs by simplifying how simple cathodic protection is you can just say well if you can squirt more dc current onto the pipe than is trying to be squirted off then you will have a, an equilibrium and there won't be any corrosion when you look at the potentials that you get from a, a railway system they could be plus 20 minus 20 and the technician looks in his little book and he says more positive than minus 0.85 or whatever it is bad more negative than minus 1.2 bad. bad oh i'm sorry to tell you sir that you've got a higher risk of um, hydrogen induced stress corrosion cracking in your pipe and rapid corrosion which is actually blatantly untrue because you have to mm -hmm. take into account how long the effect is there and the residual effect of the cathodic protection the polarization on the pipe so we gave a method to calculate that too that's very interesting. I've always said, and it's not my phrase, you know, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. And that really can be the case is that we think it's so easy because in our business, we're trying to make it understandable and easy for the asset owner or the client to understand that this isn't just black magic, but it, it has some real science behind it. And yet by simplifying it, there's the risk that someone thinks that it's too easy or incorrectly interprets the findings such as your little example mm -hmm. and that can actually be more detrimental than anything yes so there's that fine balance <laughs> whilst cp is easy in concept it is actually difficult practically to apply and i studiously avoided electrochemistry in my early years 
and a few years ago somebody well it was when we when we started to talk about ac corrosion which i was involved in the very first ac corrosion works in europe and contributed to the very first textbook on it i realized that actually there's a whole world there that i didn't know about because somebody else had already taken care of it and told me i needed to get to minus 0.85 or minus 1.2, whatever. But when you start to look into it, it's really, really interesting and fascinating. And it clarifies an awful lot of things about why you can get quite high AC current densities, but not get corrosion. Well, how come? We've got these values that tell us this, that, and the other. And we have to look at what's going on in the electrochemistry to explain it. So I've become a, a latter-day converted electrochemist. And... Uh, I spend a lot of time reading up about it and learning about it and how interesting and important it is. You've challenged me, I have to confess. Electrochemistry has been something that I have tried to pretend was never in my curriculum at university because um, I didn't really get it. But you're absolutely right. If we can understand the chemistry, there's more to corrosion than just the electrons. Yeah. There's what's happening in solution. It's, there's and... a whole world down there, Vanessa, that you have to go into. And I sometimes use the analogy that if you look at, we all know that atoms are made up of electrons and all quarks and all sorts of bits and pieces, and they're orbiting around. If you imagine that the atom was the size of a football, how far away do you think the nearest electron would be? And if you scale it up, it's 800 meters on that scale. Yes. So it's not surprising that nasty little things can happen when you get yes. the movement of ions on, in, in small gaps yes. and how the behavior is different in small gaps and big gaps. And somebody said to me, well, if you're so smart and you think that these atoms and molecules are mainly made up of air, why can't I put my hand through this brick wall? Because I clearly can't, and yet you're telling me it's full of space. And I said, well, it's a bit like a bicycle wheel. Imagine a bicycle wheel and you look inside that it's mainly air, just a few spokes coming around. Well, you whiz those spokes around at a high speed, then try and put your hand through. That's basically what's happening because these electrons are moving so fast. And with the knowledge we have these days, you can actually calculate how fast they move because we know what mass they are and we know what the strength of their magnetic field is and we can calculate how fast they move. You've just blown my mind. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um very challenged to go back and have a look. And I always like to find examples that make things concrete for me. And I've never thought of it that way, but that's exactly the kind of illustration I really enjoy because I like to try and relate it to stuff that I can see and visualize rather than, as you say, these tiny little specks that nobody can see and are they really there? Well, um, you've got a treat in store because Dr. Marcus Buchler is the man. I mean, he is an electrochemist and uh, he... He has a gift for being able to explain these things. And it was Marcus who forced me into it. I, sa I said to him, I don't take any notice of this electrochemistry. You don't need it for CP. He said, no, you don't, because we've done all the work for you and told you what you need to do. But if you do know about it, it will certainly open your eyes and enlarge your understanding and enrich what you're doing. And he's absolutely right. Now I'm, I'm reading about it all the time and uh, slowly getting to grips with it. Well, that's, that's wonderful, Ken, and, and thank you because you've just given us a fabulous advert because Marcus, of course, will be joining us next week on Bite Size Corrosion. And, but it's been wonderful to, to hear a little bit more of your perspective of corrosion to gain a little bit of a glimpse into what happens in other places. And uh, you've certainly opened my eyes to do a little bit of thinking and research. And, of course, next week with Dr. Marcus Buchler joining us. I'm sure we're gonna have another fascinating discussion about Indeed, uh, corrosion yes. with his perspectives. He comes to us with a background in a uh, very strong in theory, very, very able to communicate clearly, sitting in the pristine Swiss Alps. I think it's a completely different perspective yeah, yeah. that he'll be bringing to our discussion. I'm sure you'll all profit greatly because not only does he have the academic background, but he, he has a good practical knowledge as well. Indeed. Well, thank you, Ken, so much. And I really hope that our audience has enjoyed the time, found you interesting. So thank you, Ken. That's a great pleasure. And if it's any consolation, the temperature here in the summer, the height of the summer, is about the same as it is in Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs>
today. Thank, Thank you, you very much, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you all again. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.